and a less extreme faction of South African labor movements in that they were very racialized and very uh, uh, socialistic, but not explicitly. Well, so. I mean, I would really say, well, if you really want to know the, the way these the way these ethnic ghettos start to develop in northern cities is actually it's uh, it's the, it's a function of their churches. Um, so like. The way in, I said we're not going to get into this, but we're going to get into it. <laughs> yeah, um, make it brief because I actually haven't heard this thesis before. I'm very interested. This is, is not a, so this is not up. a thesis. This is this is objectively provable fact, okay. and it's All like right. you know, it's this is the mainstream historical opinion. Like yeah, I'm not, I am not doing revisionism here. Yeah. Okay. So the the the. Uh, the real and you'll you can find studies of this all over the place. So like well, there's one great one is a study on Lithuanian Catholics. But the way immigration would work from the old world, especially you know in the late 19th century through the 1920s and the 1930s, 40s, 50s, we didn't have as much immigration after the 24 Act. But the way this tends to work is that a few sort of pioneers move in. Okay, Lithuanian pioneers, Polish pioneers, Swedish pioneers. Okay, um, Germans. Not really Germans in the sense that you think of them, because there's Hanoverians and there's German Protestants and German Catholics, and they're they're a little bit different. You know, they um, the way this sort of works is they, they they move in, okay, and you know the um, city services, you know, the welfare state doesn't exist, and so if you ever see pictures of 19th century northern cities, they look awful. You know, it's like an inferno. It is like you know you stumbled into the fourth circle of hell or something like that. You see tenement slums everywhere. Um, there's obviously no, there's obviously not a lot of uh, infrastructure in place to help these immigrants as they arrive. They're, you know, they're frequently victimized. And so one of the things that happens is they start, they bring their churches with them. You know, they bring their missionary churches with them, usually Catholic. And um, they, the, the church becomes the organizing unit of the community. Okay. So it like becomes like, kind of like it becomes the, the it's, it's a social welfare institution as well as one of sacramental salvation and um as you know as these these these, these communities start to develop say if you're swedish or to say we'll use lithuanian again if you're lithuanian and you're moving to like one of these northern cities are you going to move to the other side of town or are you going to move right in, move in right next to the lithuanian church you know that you attend of course you move right into the lithuanian church and this pattern of development continued for about a hundred years and so it creates this kind of patchwork of these little ethnic ghettos all over northern cities and you can still see them today you know like of course whenever i go up there i feel like jungle jack hannah or something like that you know it's like like eyeballing these things with fascination it's like oh well, yeah there's a there's a Pal palestinian neighborhood never seen one of these before but you know the <laughs> but this is what hard segregation looks like so this is because these these communities are very self-contained and they don't interact with one another socially very much because the ghetto itself is their, you know, is the, you know, it is their network. Okay? There's not much incentive for them to move around. And the only place you would see them, the only place you would see these people interacting is on the assembly line itself. And because by the 1910s, the, you know, the, the Anglo, the native Anglo population has gotten quite nervous about the number of non-English speaking persons that are in there you know, that are, that are, that are in their country, they start devising methods to keep these people divided. And one of the things that they'll do is they'll keep, they'll have an assembly line rule where like, if you have a Bohemian, you know, from, from the, you know, or I guess ethnically you'd call them Czechs, but you know, if you have a, you have a Czech, you have a Pole, you have a, you know, and you have a German. Okay. You won't put two German speakers on the assembly line next to one another. You won't put two Czech right. speakers on I the assembly line next to one this, another yeah. because you're, you're you're quite literally preventing them from being able to communicate with one another. Because what you're terrified of is unions. You're terrified. Of, you're terrified of this teeming underclass that you've imported, um, realizing that there are more of them now than there are of you. Okay, and so there are you know the develop the social development of northern cities is actually fraught with a lot more ethnic friction, a lot more isolation, a lot more jostling for position. And that's what I refer to as hard segregation. You know, you could grow up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood in, uh, in Chicago, or you could grow up in a Lithuanian Catholic neighborhood in Chicago, and you might live 18, 20 years of your life without meeting, you know, someone who's not, uh, who's not an Irish Catholic. Right, much, not, much more anarchic compared to the uh, southern system. 
Right, right. And so this, I mean, this creates this very, this is a, it's considerably more alien. You know, it's the, the, the ability to communicate, the, you know, the familiarity, and the ease of communication isn't there. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it ends, it, segregation in the North has a much harder edge to it than segregation in the South. Does. And that was, again, that was a long, it was a long rant. Well, sorry. It, it kind of explains what we see today, <laughs> at, at least in some of this, because, uh, in these large cities, um, there are whites that do still stick around, uh, despite the fact that you know they seemingly emulate um, every two to four years, um, at least in a small part in terms of blocks or whatever. You know, but still not exactly the most desirable place to live, a uh, place where you'll have an open riot um, on a pretty regular basis, like a it's so so regular that you can plot it on a weather map if you remember the uh, uh, if you remember like the rioting weather map that came out a few months ago. Um, all, all of this being said, um, Scott Adams here seems to be talking a lot about the soft segregation, um, probably more as a peaceful route, um, than the hard segregation, um, at least implicitly, because he doesn't seem to be very racially motivated. He's not saying we need to harm them or kill them or exclude them or whatever. Um, he seems to be saying these people want to get you. Um, and therefore you need to get out. Whether or not he meant it or he was looking for attention or whatever, it doesn't matter that this is what he said um, at the time. So is this uh, the peaceful solution, Sandbatch? Hey, how, how well does the soft segregation work versus the hard segregation? Uh, you know, what's the, uh, how's it looking in practice? Well, I mean, it, it's obviously, it's, really this is just the, the part of me that, and one of the things that prevent, again, redlining is a very real issue that, that, I don't want to talk about who was involved with redlining, what, you know, particular, you know, group that has historical stereotypes of parasitism and opportunism <laughs> that was, you know, because I don't know if those stereotypes are true, you know, but the um, redlining was the practice of not of, and it, 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 of course it was colluded upon by politicians as well, but redlining is sort of the practice of, of not granting loans to particular ethnic groups in particular place in particular places. And it's almost always blacks um, that or, or giving very parasitic, very unfavorable loan terms to them in certain areas. Um, I am, I don't have a lot of ideological positions, but ideologically I am contra compulsion in nearly all cases. And so, like, you know, to ask me, does soft, okay, so if you suddenly remove all of the barriers to people living wherever they want to, um, yeah, I think soft segregation happens. We, we actually see this in the South now, because one, of the, because one of the interesting aspects of the civil rights regime is that, uh, and people, and this because it lasted way longer than people thought it did, it wasn't until, really, it wasn't until I was in college that the last uh, sort of federal overseers that prevented Southern cities from, you know, doing another segregation uh, were, and it wasn't until I don't think maybe 2015 that most of those statutes sunsetted and the, um, and it became possible now for like, you know, for like busing to not happen and for, you know, certain racial quotas to not happen. And what we immediately saw was of course, White people in the city of Baton Rouge, in particular, they immediately separated themselves from the city of Baton Rouge proper, and now they actually have a separate polity with a separate uh, city system. It's called the City of Saint George, and it's like this donut around <laughs> around the actual city of Baton Rouge. It's pretty obviously what it is. But the uh, the alternate, the, the you know the, the the converse reaction that you know that the, the shitlib community didn't didn't expect coming is that black people did the same thing they immediately you know they immediately started forming their own communities and some exurb and not even in the inner cities and places like the name of the city scotlandville um became you know immediately as soon as the as soon as the ability to do this you know as soon as the legal ability to do this uh became available to them they went and built a relatively affluent black suburb and they just, you know, if you ask them it's like yeah Black people want to live around black people. White people want to live around white people. I don't, you, you, so I remember, <laughs> you know, sort of like these patterns uh, developing, probably not as uh, uh, voluntarily, though I, that could be wrong, certainly. 
um, sort of in like the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, uh, where you sort of saw the parallel development of the two societies. Um, is this better for both sides uh, than the uh, the opposing hard segregation uh, that you were talking about in the North? You know, how how is it looking for them on the ground if this is what they naturally gravitate towards? Well, you know, you're talking about in the North. I don't know. I, I don't spend enough time up there to really know what it looks or like. But South. I think yeah. I, in the, the South, you know, the South is actually relatively well positioned right now. This is one of the reasons, you know, you don't really see a lot of you don't really see a lot of racial agitation in the South um, outside of a few areas. You know, like, of course, I live in one, but the but you don't really see a lot of the same sort of tenseness in life. And I think a lot of the, of course, there are, you know, to compare the northern and southern sensibility um, is, you know, that's like 30 or 40 streams or maybe a whole podcast. You know, it could be its own. It could be its own podcast. Uh, but I do think in general that and it could, it could be economic factors as well the south looks much better economically right now than the north does but i think what you are seeing in the north right now is you know paying a butcher's bill for you know several you know at this point in time several centuries of this of this kind of you know compulsion compulsive uh compulsive really top-down management that maybe didn't exist in the south and I, i do think that i do think that just letting people you know form their own communities as they're going to organically is one i don't I don't think there's any way to argue that it's not the, of course there's people that will, I'm not one of them. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's a really valid way to argue that it's not better, but you know, you know, just say, yeah, Scott Adams has come to this, you know, this, 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 this kind of one of these reasons why this kind of seems like a non-issue to me. He's like, Scott Adams is like, we need to get away from violent black people who hate us. Like, well, yeah, if the violent, if there are violent black people who hate you, you should get away from them. You know, that's like, I think you would call this a tautology if I were to say this in the chat. I use that word the wrong way all the time. I, I, I don't know what I don't know what it really means, but that's what yeah, that's what I would call a tautology. 